Welcome. My name is Clara Evelyn Davidson McLean. Thank you for inviting me to come from the next place to share a bit about me and my family. I was born on August 17th, 1872 in Argente, Quebec. You'll notice my headstone date is off by one year. When I was five, my father and his bachelor brother, Joseph, journeyed west to Manitoba and secured adjoining land grants. My father built a sod shanty and by the following year, he'd built a log house and several outbuildings. So when I was six, my parents, four siblings and I journeyed west to our new home in New Haven near Manadu. We traveled first by train, then by an ox-drawn wagon. It was October and it was cold. The oxen kept breaking through the ice and when our wagon got stuck in the mud, I told my father, this country is good for nothing but skunks. <laughs> the journey that today would take 25 hours by car seemed to last forever but eventually we reached our new home. My father was instrumental in getting New Haven up and running. Presbyterian services were held in our home and then later moved to the schoolhouse that my father built. Our family grew to include 12 children and my sister was the first white child born in New Haven. My mother was busy raising the 12 of us, but she also baked bread for our less fortunate neighbors and taught us a lot about being charitable to others. My father believed strongly in the importance of education. He gave my brothers $2,000 toward their education, but thought my sisters and I should, like most pioneer girls, help out at home then get married. But my sisters and I persuaded our father otherwise, and he found a school for us in Manadu where we finished our education. I obtained a teaching certificate and began teaching in 1889 in Mowbray, near the North Dakota border when I was just 17 years old. I took some classes at the University of Manitoba while I was teaching, but I didn't ever receive a diploma. When I was evangelizing for the Protestant Church in Manitoba, I met a handsome student named John Norman McLean. He had almost red hair, was 10 years older than me, and I was smitten. He would go out as a circuit preacher in a horse and buggy, and I would accompany him. John earned degrees in Canada, then completed advanced seminary studies in California. In 1893, he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister. We got married that year and immigrated to Vacaville, California, where John served as a full-time minister. We moved twice in the ensuing decade. In Bozeman, Montana, John took over the oldest Presbyterian church in the state. We became naturalized in Bozeman in 1900. Two years later, we moved to Clarinda, Iowa, where our sons were born. Norman Fitzroy on December 23rd, 1902, and Paul Davidson on November 5th, 1905. The Reverend worked entire weeks on his sermons and kept busy baptizing, marrying, and burying parishioners. My days were filled raising our sons, keeping house, and tending my husband's flock. In 1909, our Clarinda Church community gathered to bid us a tender and tearful farewell. The men gave the Reverend $100 to help us journey to our new assignment in Missoula, Montana. He was humbled by their generous gift, which was more than a minister's average monthly salary. 
I was humbled too by gifts and thanks from the women of the church and the young people's society. We arrived in Missoula when Norman was six and Paul was three. Missoula helped shape our family and will always hold a cherished place in my heart. First Presbyterian Church was a thriving, welcoming congregation. While the Reverend worked on his sermons, I ran the church as Norman later described. I sat with parishioners when they were ill, visited new members, and ran the Ladies Aid Society and Christian Endeavor. I helped launch three Westminster Guild chapters, the Zeta chapter, Sentinel Circle, and the Claire McLean chapter for high school and college girls. It was gratifying to see the girls' and women's influences in all aspects of church work. In 1910, Reverend McLean was granted an honorary Doctor of Divinity by Parsons College in Fairfield, Iowa. He was so proud of that title. From that point forward, in public, I always referred to him as Dr. McLean. We tutored our boys at home until 1913, when Norman was nearly 11. I taught them their letters and numbers, and Dr. McLean taught them reading and writing. We read aloud to our sons, which brought me great joy. When Norman had to read Shakespeare and poetry in high school, he and I would sit in the kitchen. I'd hold his hand atop the table and tap his hand on the table in time to the rhymes and meters of the plays and poems. He said the words reverberated in his body along with my voice. Throughout their years in Missoula, our sons received robust educations and became excellent fly fishermen as well. Dr. McLean and I moved to Helena, Montana in 1925 when he accepted the prestigious post of Executive Secretary of the Montana Presbyterian Church. Norman had already graduated from Dartmouth and Paul was at Dartmouth pursuing a journalism degree. I was so proud of our sons. Norman became a professor at the University of Chicago. Paul became a journalist and worked for several Montana newspapers. Paul had some struggles though. He had a reputation for fighting and when he became older we heard whispers of drinking, gambling, and women. Dr. McLean asked Norman to invite Paul to Chicago. So Paul, excuse me, Norman helped Paul to get a job as a publicity writer at the University of Chicago in 1937. Dr. McLean and I had adventures of our own in the meantime. John retired in 1933 then we embarked upon a two-year mission on the Crow Reservation in Poplar, Montana. In 1935, we returned to Missoula and bought a lovely home on Blaine Street. Our happy retirement years were upended though in 1938. Paul was fatally beaten in a Chicago alley early in the morning of May 2nd. He was only 32 years old. Investigators said he was a victim of a robbery by persons unknown, and the case was never solved. Norman accompanied Paul's body via train back to Missoula, and four days after Paul died, people jammed into the First Presbyterian Church for his funeral. We were devastated by Paul's death. Following the funeral, Dr. McLean, Norman and I spent several weeks grieving together at our family cabin at Seeley Lake. Dr. McLean aged noticeably in subsequent years 
and died of a stroke in 1941. I lived almost 11 years longer, surrounded by friends and church community members in Missoula. Summer highlights were visitors, were visits from Norman, his wife Jessie and their children, Jean and John. I longed for Norman to return to Missoula, and in 1952 I sent him a letter offering him $1,000 for the purchase of a car. I hoped that might bring him west. I also wrote that I'd be taking flowers to this cemetery on Decoration Day and that I would, quote, silently, prayerfully turn my face to the skies and will feel you present. I died several weeks later on July 5th, 1952, shortly before my 80th birthday. Later, I reveled from afar when Norman published semi-autobiographical novellas in A River Runs Through It and Other Stories. This is the 25th anniversary of his book. And some of you may have seen a rendition of our family come to life on the big screen in the film that followed. Perhaps some of you knew or know some of my family? You? Okay, unless anybody has any other family snippets that they know, I'd like to thank you for coming and I hope that you enjoy some other stories on this lovely Missoula afternoon. Thank you.